My name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager and uh, welcome to our first town hall meeting. We'll have two uh, between now and the council's budget adoption on April 23rd. And um, if I could uh, ask Mayor Baruch to make a few welcoming comments as well. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this is really exciting. This is really the kickoff of the public budget process is to have this town hall um, Wyatt uh, presented his budget to council last week. Um, so this is really our first opportunity to start getting feedback from the community about it. So we look forward to getting your feedback as this process um, unfolds. And we'll be having um, several uh, different venues uh, where we can get your comments, whether they be in via email or in person. And Wyatt's going to go over those um, just momentarily. So we look forward to getting your feedback. And really, this is all about the community and getting your feedback. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over back to Wyatt, and then uh, we'll go through the presentation. Thank okay. you all for being here this morning. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, let me make a few introductions. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, provide a presentation of just a few slides on the general government budget, and then I will be joined by Susan Carney, who will, uh, is the chair of the school board, and she will present the school budget and, uh, and uh, a, a few slides as well. Um, some other introductions, we have uh, school board members Greg Raznak and uh, Cecily Shea here with us. We have our school superintendent, uh, Tony Jones. This is our first town hall meeting uh, on the budget. Uh, on the uh, staff side, we have assistant city manager Cindy Mester. We have our CFO, Richard LeCondre, in the back. Um, and we have our communications uh, staff. Um, who will uh, provide microphones when we get to the questions um, and answers times. But Susan Finarelli uh, and Amy Bednor will help with that. And the reason we have microphones is not really for this room, but it's for uh, those who will uh, watch this on Channel 12 on our uh, cable access uh, uh, channel. And, and thank you for our cable folks who are here to, to film this this morning. Um, so we'll go through um, an overview of, of, uh, of the budget in just a few slides. And that is the goal this morning, is to provide sort of the big picture, a broad overview of, of the budget and the CIP for FY13, and get your feedback and your comments on it. Uh, budgeting is all about assigning resources to uh, the goals and objectives of the city organization and the school organization. And the council has adopted a vision statement that helps organize our work in, turn, in trying to accomplish long-term <laughs> objectives. Um, and this vision statement is po posted on the website with all the, the, the text that's associated with it. Uh, but this is, these are the things that we're looking towards to try and accomplish in our budget. Some key pr uh, priorities that we have in this budget. Uh, council adopted budget guidance back in November that laid out the parameters for budget development and, and uh, this budget is in compliance with those. But some key uh, priorities in the budget, successful development, we do have additional resources towards economic development and planning in the budget, outstanding government in the area of, of training and resources uh, for employees, uh, funding for world-class schools, and there's a strong emphasis in this budget on investment in inf infrastructure, and we'll talk uh, about what some of those investments are. In terms of budget guidance, um, the budget guidance was that expenditure growth for the FY13 budget should be paid for out of economic growth. In other words, uh, no, no increase in the tax rates. And this budget that's pr that I've presented to the council would keep the tax rate at $1.27. Uh, the council asked for a focus on infrastructure, as I just mentioned. Uh, the budget has $15.6 million of, of investments in capital infrastructure for schools, general government, stormwater, and transportation, among other things. The city's adopted policies on, debt, uh, on, on the amount of debt service that we can afford and about, on how we should use our uh, reserves or our fund balance, and this budget is in compliance with those, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Employee compensation, the council budget guidance was that compensation needs to be competitive and sustainable. Um, I have built in a 3% salary increase that's based on the FY 2009 base uh, compensation levels. So that's uh, four, four years ago. Um, this is, um, um, I, I think, with that and, uh, and comparable to other jurisdictions, we do have an issue in terms of comparability and competitiveness on compensation, 
and we'll be working with the council on that as we go through uh, budget uh, evaluation in our work sessions. Pensions, uh, it's a big issue nationwide. Uh, the city's pension fund is better funded than most around the country. Uh, and that's because we've always fully funded the actuarially required contribution. This budget does that again this year. And then VRS, uh, the state has not been doing as good a job at funding its obligations for future pension costs. Um, and so uh, the city is evaluating strategies where we can try to protect ourselves against very predictable increases in pension costs on the state side in the future. Here's a broad overview of where our, our funds come from in the city. 60% of our revenue comes from real estate taxes. Um, the rest of our revenues come from, uh, this is the car tax, it's also business tangible. Uh, our meals, utility, and other taxes is 9%. Sales taxes is 5%. Business licenses uh, bring in 4% of our revenues. Uh, state and federal funds are 6%. And then fees and recovered costs, i.e. all of the, the fees that people pay to uh, participate in recreation and park programs or building permits, uh, that's 6% of our revenues. The big story in our budgets over the last four years as we've gone through the recession is that all of these sources of revenue, uh, economic uh, sales tax, you know, business type of taxes have shrunk. And we've had a larger reliance on real estate taxes. Uh, in 2006, this was 50% of our revenue streams and real estate has had to grow uh, to, to uh, make up for the decreases here even as we were making very significant uh, cuts in our, in our budgets in the past three years. Here's a revenue summary uh, of all of our major revenue streams. The bottom line is, is that revenues will be growing for FY13 by 6.7%. And that's because of assessed value growth of homes and businesses in the city and the growth in, uh, in a lot of these other revenue streams. So real estate tax revenue will grow by 5.2%. Uh, personal property will grow by 9.6%. Uh, meals and utilities uh, by 6.1%. Sales tax uh, growth of 15%, and this is uh, uh, the, the recession uh, uh, being uh, replaced by a greater uh, consumption in, in the city, but also the BJ's uh, opening up and being fully operational. We're seeing the benefit of that. Business licenses up 11%. The, um, these revenue forecasts are based on our 11 actuals as well as our FY12 year-to-date actuals. Assessed value, um, overall assessed value is growing by 4%. For the first time in several years, we have growth in the commercial sector. We had had double-digit contraction in the commercial sector in terms of assessed values. In, uh, in FY11 uh, and FY10. Uh, so it's good to see growth in that area. The, uh, the median household property tax bill has been growing over the past uh, several years. And this is due to the fact that all those other sources of revenue have been contracting and commercial uh, assessed values have been contracting. And even as we cut our budgets, um, the median tax, household tax bill has had to grow over the past several years. Uh, here's a comparison of regional tax rates. The, uh, this is the City of Falls Church at $1.27. Uh, Arlington is the lowest tax rate in the region at 97, uh, just a, call it 98 cents. Um, and Manassas Park is the highest at $1.65. These are all the proposed rates. There's always a big asterisk behind this chart because there are lots of things that the city includes in its tax rates that other localities don't. Solid waste pickup is, is one big one. And so this is apples and oranges in many respects. I mean, for instance, Fairfax County, you would need to tack on about eight cents on their tax rate to pay for solid waste pickup, just as one example. But I, do, I have included in the Fairfax <coughs> County rate here their stormwater fee and their leaf pickup charge, which are uh, two things you, know, you often hear about the Fairfax County tax rate of $1.09, but uh, you need to factor in those, those uh, built-in charges of stormwater and leaf pickup that they do have on the tax bill. Uh, 
But with those caveats, still the city is uh, essentially in the middle of the pack in terms of tax rates in the Northern Virginia region. Expenditures, here's where the money goes. Um, and we need to get on the same page in terms of what the exact percentage is. But it's 42% uh, is, what, is what we're showing of, uh, of the total expenditures goes to our schools. And that's just the local transfer to schools. The schools also have uh, uh, state funding and a small amount of federal funding for their budget as well. And then going around the pie chart, administration is 9%. Our sheriff and court services is 3%. Our fire and police is 14% of our annual expenditures. Public works is 8%. At streets, maintain, maintaining our, our, all of our facilities, maintaining our trees, the city arborist is in this. Recreation parks in the library is 6%. Health and welfare, 3%. Planning and economic development is 5%. And then the rest of this is all capital uh, spending in one form or another, with debt service being 7%. CIP 1%, that's the PAYGO portion of CIP, and contribution to reserves 2%. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of fund balance policy in just a, just a moment. For the uh, broad view of expenditures, again, the bottom line is a 6.7% growth in expenditures, similar to our revenues. Uh, general government will be growing by 4.4%. Our debt service is growing by 13%. The school transfer would grow by 7.3%. Um, capital spending will grow by 135%. And fund balance restoration, which we had funded in, in FY12 at $2.3 million, will drop down to 1.1 to fund our capital reserves. Um, and this money is, is being redeployed in, into operations in FY13. Um, a couple of slides just on new initiatives that are in the FY13 budget that I've proposed to the City Council, and the Council will be reviewing these over the coming weeks. Um, but I do have two positions uh, proposed in, in our Development Services Department uh, to accelerate our work on our uh, planning for in our economic development areas um, and to get our comprehensive plan update uh, moving. Uh, we do have a part-time accountant position in finance and public safety. Uh, we'll be doing a refresh of our police vehicles and we'll be doing that with a short-term uh, debt uh, to purchase five uh, or change out five police vehicles. A part-time fire marshal for fire inspections in our commercial buildings. We have a sheriff deputy position in the budget to assist with prisoner transport. We are going to be relying less on the Arlington County detention facility because it is one of the most expensive detention facilities in Virginia and relying on um, a lower cost facility that will uh, have some prisoner transport costs associated with it. But we think that this is a net savings if we can uh, move our prisoners to a lower cost facility. And recreation and parks, pretty much a status quo budget, but we do have the old, uh, the old blue van which we use for the senior center and for transporting children to camp and we'll be replacing that. In the libraries, we've been able to fund the library board's top priority items for restoration of funding for uh, books and, and uh, their transition over to more uh, virtual electronic resources where you can check books out for your Kindle and your iPad and things like that. And then um, uh, a step up in maintenance and new furniture for the libraries. We have, uh, th it's not that bad. <laughs> Yet, <laughs> the, uh, we have a position of, of, of a facilities manager, and um, we have one person who takes care of the city's 11 buildings, and we need additional capacity to manage contracts and to do project management for our facilities. In IT, we have upgrades to our core uh, IT infrastructure, which we've cut very significantly over the last three years, and we need to uh, restore funding there. Uh, and employee training. Also, you know, in, back in 2007 when we were cutting our budgets, some of the first things we, we cut were uh, in the HR area uh, for employee training, uh, professional development, and I'm proposing to restore funding uh, for some of those programs. These are the trends. With, with those new initiatives, this is the trend for our, our total funded positions in our budget. Um, we have traditionally been just at about 200 employees for the general fund, and with the recession, we dropped down 14 percent 
of our workforce to 179 in the current year budget, and there's a net gain of three full-time equivalent positions in the budget recommendations that I've made to the City Council, which I've just, uh, just listed. I'll shift to the Capital Improvements Program. Um, the, the overarching themes is try to, to reinvest back in, into our infrastructure. And, um, and to do that, we need to also rebuild our financial foundation, which we've taken big steps to do over the past two fiscal years, and we'll continue to do that with this, with this budget by funding um, our fund balance of capital reserves and keeping our debt service within policy limits. But here's where the investments would go in the CIP and broad brush, and this is taking the full five-year look at our CIP. 27% uh, of our spending would be for general government facilities, including the library and, uh, and, and city hall facilities. 27% would go to school facilities. 20% would go towards stormwater improvements. And 20% would go towards transportation improvements. And this is primarily funded uh, through uh, state and federal money. This would be largely funded um, through a mechanism of creating a new stormwater enterprise fund, which would be an initiative um, that we would undertake this summer to build into the FY14 budget. Um, and then these smaller slices of the CIP, Reckon Parks to uh, implement our Parks Master's Plans, IT, and then Public Safety, which is some improvements down at, at Station 6, uh, the fire station. Some key projects that we have in FY13. Um, we have $310,000 for parks and also for the, the lighting of the baseball field at, uh, at George Mason High School. We have $4.4 million for school facilities. That's $4 million for the renovation of TJ and then $400,000 for improvements throughout the school system. Uh, $4 million in general government, which would be for the, uh, the work at City Hall to create a single point of entry uh, to create a, a safer court operations and to create more public meeting space in the front of the building and meet other sort of critical safety needs at City Hall. Uh, stormwater, we have 1.3 million funded in the CIP and that will be towards going towards the priority projects identified in the stormwater management plan. And then transportation, we have uh, just over uh, four and a half million dollars of state and federal money to implement our pedestrian improvements. A lot of that is the safe, well, a, a decent chunk of that is the safe routes to schools money that we just were awarded uh, that will be, uh, 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 make it safer for, for kids to walk to school. Um, the big breakouts then, um, IT, 550,000 in 2013, uh, a total of 8.6 for public facilities, that's school and general government. Uh, 1.4, uh, this is principally stormwater uh, funding. Uh, then the transportation improvements that state and federal grant funded, and then Rec and Parks, 310000 for a total of $15.6 million. Um, just uh, a few more slides uh, on fund balance, which I mentioned before. We drew our fund balance down very sharply as we were uh, dealing with the fact that uh, uh, we had to pay back a lot of money from the general fund to the water fund with uh, Judge Nay's decision in 2010, along with the recession. And so we've taken very strong steps in the last two fiscal years to build fund balance back up to our policy targets. Our policy targets is that we should have in reserves, unassigned, about two months worth of operating expenses. That's what 17% represents and that's our policy target. So we'll get back to that in FY13. And then debt service, um, this takes it all the way out to FY17. This is where we are right now. Um, in, uh, in FY12, we benefited from a big step down in debt service. And so when we talk about the, the money that we go towards capital, in the FY12 budget, we took all of this step down, which was about $1.3 million, and kept it in the budget so we could invest it into capital. Um, if we were to not implement any aspects of our CIP, this is the natural trajectory of our annual debt service. It would step down to about $3 million per year. If we implement the CIP with the public facilities, that's, that's the, the main thing that's debt financed in the budget. Our, uh, our debt service payments will stay below $6 million and in line with where we have traditionally been at, at around between 5 and $6 million per year for debt service. 
Uh, so we do believe that the CIP is ambitious. It's an investment in infrastructure, but it's also feasible. And we try to keep our CIP feasible. Um, schedule. Um, we have uh, uh, two work sessions per week as we go through uh, towards April 23rd for the adoption of the 2013 budget by the City Council. Um, but between now and then, we'll have uh, another town hall meeting on April 14th as we get closer to adoption, just to report back out as to the, uh, the consensus in terms of, of changes uh, to what I've proposed to the budget. Um, whoops. <coughs> Let's do it all over again. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now. I, c I could pause here for some questions or turn it over to, uh, to, to Susan for the school budget. Let's do that. Uh, just lastly on the schedule, what we're sh working towards is April 23rd, adoption of the 2013 budget by the City Council, and then this budget that we're talking about goes into effect on July 1st of this year. So let's pause here for questions on the, on the general government budget, and then we'll hear from Ms. Carney on the school budget. Ed. The reserve target has usually been 12 percent, but now it's 17. So, what, what's the reason for stepping it up, and does that have any impact on on the ability to fund services overall? The uh, the change that we we made this year uh, was to change our reserve policy from 12 percent of revenues to 17 percent of expenditures, and um, and the we so that is a net increase in terms of our, our reserves. What we see is that if you look across the country at, at municipalities that are uh, under 50,000 in population, that most have uh, carry reserves between 20 and 22 percent of their, of their annual expenditures. And we traditionally have as well. So 12 percent, I think, is it was an unrealistically low policy number. Um, and in terms of maintaining a good solid bond rating, we do have a AAA rating from Fitch and, and high ratings from the other agencies, fund balance is, is, is very important to them. One other point to it that makes it a little bit less academic is the fact that uh, as we went through the difficulties that we went through as an organization, the fund balance was absolutely critical. Um, it allowed us to bridge uh, to a point where we could responsibly manage extraordinarily sharp decreases in revenues. And uh, so um, I think this is not really an academic discussion. This, th these reserves have been, uh, had great practical value for the city just in, in our recent history. <coughs> Tina. Uh, Inter-jurisdictional contracts. Yes. Why are they going up so much? Are we using, we're outsourcing more. I see a couple references to city attorney's office. But are we being charged more for those services and using more outsourcing? The, um, what I think is, has been happening is that all the local governments are under financial pressure. And so they've looked at all their contractual relationships from their own perspective. With respect to our, our Arlington County contracts, there are things that uh, there was administrative drift, I think is probably the best way to characterize it over the past 10 or 15 years in terms of how they were charging us for services that we were receiving. Uh, one big one, um, we uh, partner with Arlington County for 911 dispatch and for our police radios. Um, all of our calls go through their call center and our radios go through their radio system. We had agreements back in the 1990s that we would pay for those on a proportional share. and. Uh, we were never billed for that. And so the, the change is, is that we're actually implementing agreements that we made back in the 90s. Um, so that's part of the story. Um, now, we've worked very hard with Arlington County to make sure that it's sustainable and fair uh, on how we're, we're being charged. And it's been, a, I think, a, a good collaboration. Um, but nonetheless, the bottom line is the costs are going up. Ed. I didn't have a question, but I had a comment. Um, I see that there's expenditures for, um, for, the, for the watershed for 
flood control and, and all of that. Are, are the, just have, do you have a question? Are those higher than in the past? And then second, I know that there's a real uh, economic benefit for making those investments in terms of insurability and you know, reduction in risk or risk perception and uh, just getting that into context so that those kind of expenditures are really supported, I think, is yeah. just, just really important. Um, but in terms of whether this is a, an increase or not, I wasn't sure, so I wanted to ask that question. Yeah. Um, stormwater is, is real important. Uh, we had a lot of property owners who experienced damage in the rains last fall, and they have, you know, uh, intermittently, uh, far more frequently than we'd like to see. Stormwater is difficult, though, in that the days of easy fixes for stormwater are over. Um, you know, we made, when, when the city made the investments to concrete line trips run and, and to do the, uh, the improvements, stormwater infrastructure on, on trips run, that made a huge difference for flooding for homes around those, those areas. But that type of a big change with investment, uh, really, those opportunities really don't exist. And so what we will be doing is be making spot repairs throughout our stormwater system. But we also have to do it in the context of under EPA regulations, there are huge uh, focus on stormwater quality. And so just making the pipe bigger and shooting it down to Fairfax County or Arlington, um, that's not acceptable. And so there has to be more of a focus on retention and, storm and stormwater quality improvements as well on, under the Chesapeake Bay rules that have been adopted. So it's, it's going to be more expensive than it's been in the past, and the, the benefit that homeowners are going to see in terms of those investments are going to be smaller, I think, in terms of, of trying to mitigate damage. I think as we go forward on this, I think those are things we're going to have to message very clearly because the real easy benefits uh, uh, are not, not really there. Uh, we can make some small marginal improvements throughout our system, but big transformative changes are, are going to be very difficult. We have uh, Jason Woodstrom, who's, who is here, um, and he's uh, a civil engineer with the city who has a great deal of expertise on stormwater matter, matters and will be managing a lot of the projects that we'll be implementing over the next year. The proposed CIP is an increase in dollars committed to the stormwater watershed yes. management. It is. Now, why don't you speak a little bit about on the operating side on stormwater management? Yeah. Um, it, and one other thing I will note in here as well is that we'll be spending money in FY13 that was appropriated in prior years. We have $1.5 million in federal grants that was appropriated in, pri in prior years that we'll be able to do improvements in the city as well. Um, on the operations side, we have been able to spend money to uh, get better equipment to maintain our stormwater, uh, a flusher truck that will, will keep the sediment out of the system. That's been a real uh, significant benefit for the residents along Randolph and Spring Street where we cleaned a lot of the debris out of those pipes in, the, in recent years and we want to maintain that level of maintenance in our system. Uh, so, so those are some uh, some key things that we're doing on stormwater. Yeah, Dave. I'd like to uh, turn our attention to the most important asset of the city, that's its employees. Can you discuss uh, the efforts of the city to make sure that it can obtain the highest quality employees? And I know you have two new folks you're looking for in planning, which I think is uh, very much needed and how you intend to be able to retain your employees, particularly in view of the stresses that are underway uh, with the water system discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and actually, to, to be fair, and the school board budget, which proposes greater increases for school employees than I think you're proposing for city employees. I may have that wrong, so you can help me with that. Well, I think one of the, the, the big issues for city employees is um, comparability in terms of what's happening in the marketplace, whether it's uh, our surrounding jurisdictions, state employees, uh, school employees, you know, equity is, is a key part of the discussion for the employees that are here now. The, um, what the city has done over the past several years, A, we've fr frozen salaries and we've asked employees to take on um, a contribution to their pensions. 
uh, 5% for employees in the basic plan and 7% in the police plan. And so uh, those are big steps. And when you look at the statewide discussion, whenever that's been discussed for state employees or for VRS employees, if there is a contribution to the VRS plan, there's always been a discussion of a comparable increase in pay to make that net neutral for the employees. And that's not what we did in the city. And so employees are, are, are sensitive to that. Um, the 3% increase in pay uh, that's in this budget um, will effectively be a flat um, in terms of what, what employees will experience in their paycheck uh, because employees did get a, a one-time bonus in FY12 to partially offset the, the, um, the cost of the increased contributions to pension. They, they took a 5% decrease in pay for the pensions and, and got uh, $1,800 to partially offset that, and that averaged out to be about 2.8% um, for your median employee in the city. Uh, so I think we've got work to do on compensation, and we do have a work session planned with the city council to discuss it in more detail, um, and I think, it is, uh, I think it's a, an important issue. Hi, uh, Bob Lajeunesse. I'm on record as opposing the fund balance as being not only excessive but unnecessary, so I'm not just trying to be cantankerous today because it's St. Patrick's Day. Um, but it, and it also strikes me as inconceivable that the average school board and municipality across the country is generating 20% more in revenue than it's spending in a given year. And so one thing I might suggest, Wyatt, um, these jurisdictions or local jurisdictional comparisons are very helpful when you talk about tax rates and um, uh, salaries and the like, salary increases uh, and the like. So I would encourage you to generate something like that in terms of the fund balance to see what Arlington and Fairfax County and other counties are doing in terms of um, generating um, what I would call a sort of soft budget constraint for themselves. Um, and one other observation or question. When I run around the city or jog around the city, I notice that there are quite a few stop signs that have slid, actually slid down the post, and so they're, they're more difficult to see. And also at one time there was talk about meeting new reflectivity uh, standards for the signs, and so yeah. it seems like we have a lot of budget issues that we could potentially be either devoting this money to um, so I'll just leave it at that. Well, uh, those are good, good comments. I do want to make one uh, uh, clarification. No one is saying that you, we should put 20% of our annual budget towards reserves. And no one says that that's what's happening around the country. Um, what we're saying is that accumulated reserves that are built up over many years should be and uh, what, what is normal for localities with 50,000 people or less is about 20%. And so that's, you know, it might have taken them 30 years to build up that level of reserves, but that's what they have uh, as their reserves. Um, and what, you know, the, the largest amounts that we've ever put towards it, I think, was 3% in, in one year because we had drawn them down so much and we needed to step back up. But now we're, we're shrinking that back down as well. Um, in terms of better visibility for signs. There are federal standards out there. They've been put off a little ways. And I think, Cindy, that's been a CIP item, so Cindy can speak to that. Good morning. Uh, we have two things in the CIP that would address your specific points, which one is the sign reflection. And it is in the CIP to start implementing for seven, 14 to 17 to be in compliance. And the uh, Public Works has a plan that's been formally submitted to VDOT for how we're going to do it each year and then the ongoing um, maintenance of it. So then I'll switch to operating. And then additionally, as part of the CIP, we're um, embarking on the pedestrian, bicycle, traffic calming plan. And we're having the first work session on Monday and then targeting adoption May 26. That includes a lot of our signs, our crosswalks, the ped accessibility, poles and sidewalks, uh, things that make it hard to walk or bike. There'll be bike lanes. And so in the CIP, there's proposed $300,000 a year, um, and that's predominantly federal money. And then once again, we have to look at the operating budget for public works to make sure the signs, once installed, are maintained. Hi. 
Hansen. I'm the Commissioner of Revenue and uh, kind of talking about my own budget kind of uh, situation. I've tried other channels and I just thought I would let the public know what's kind of happening in, in my particular budget. As you may know, uh, we do run the DMV Select Office in my office and uh, it was an initiative that was started by me six years ago and it's been uh, very successful and with it comes a commission and that commission has grown over the years and the state has written code expressly how to handle that commission and I have it here if anybody would like to look at it and 80 percent of that money is supposed to return to the office and it's very practical it's an increased workload it's supposed to cover costs toner cartridges you know the state provides some things but they don't provide you know a lot of things and again in this year's budget it, it's it's kind of back on my page only I've asked for a position which would be fully paid by the DMV Commission and then some and unfortunately I brought this up several years in a row and nothing has been done about it and now it's not just my opinion the Attorney General has written that this is wrong and so I'm hoping that this year the City Council will follow the law and do what's right because I can't go into my office every day looking at my people and how overworked they are and spend my weekends doing things because I can't let people down I can't let our customers down our city residents all to have this money go fill some other budget hole it's wrong and it needs to stop As Wyatt mentioned before, my name is Jason Widstrom, and I'm the civil engineer, one of the civil engineers for the city. And uh, I'm speaking today on behalf of the employees for the general government side. I am the chair of the uh, employee advisory committee. Um, so I, this is, I don't know necessarily a question for Wyatt, but uh, more, I guess, a comment. Um, in July, last July, you had, uh, the 2011 employee survey um, and a common theme had shown through when I looked at that and that was one of equity uh, certainly we've talked a little bit about the equity with our neighboring jurisdictions uh, the employee benefits task force indicated it's about we're about 15 percent um, lower than our surrounding jurisdictions but that isn't the equity issue that I hear around City Hall um, and that comes to the, the meetings uh, for, the envoy, um, for the EAC. Um, and that larger equity comes from, um, while it's maybe not much of a debate here in the city, but between us and the schools. Um, this widening gap really just shows somewhat of a disrespect for uh, our work at, at the City Hall. Uh, a lack of appreciation and a lack of commitment to the hard hardworking men and women that keep the city's day-to-day -day operations functioning so uh, I do a little math and if this proposed budget goes through as it is today um, just to give you an example an employee hired an FY09 taking home about forty thousand dollars annually with this budget would see a nine dollar increase in their paycheck from what they first took home in FY09. The same employee um, again hired in FY09 for forty thousand annually would see approximately three thousand dollars less annually than a teacher hired in the same time frame with the same salary. And this this takes into account the uh, changes in pension contributions both on the city side and also with the VRS. So again, to give you a comparison of what that difference has been over these years, it's about $9 for the general government employee to a comparison of an increase of $115 a paycheck to the teachers. Um, and, and so that's why during this budget season, the EAC is and the employees in general are, uh, are gonna show some support this year to, uh, to to get a compensation package that is equitable, um, that is at least 3% across last year's funding level, and uh, push for a co detailed compensation study and a compensation philosophy from the City Council. Related, three full-time equivalencies. Yes. That accounts for attrition because I started tick marks and I've got a couple of planners, a facility manager, a, another half on fire marshal, HR analyst, um, finance, 
So three in the end, counting some attrition that you're predicting? Yes, yeah, so that's a, it's a net increase of, of three full-time equivalents. That's right. Thanks. Hi, Wyatt. Good morning. Um, my question goes to economic development, which along with the schools I view as the top priorities for our city. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you think about the trade-off between investment in economic development and uh, savings and fund balances, not just our regular fund balance, but the new capital fund as well. Um, I'm just wondering what your, what your thinking is about how you make those trade-offs. Well, um, uh, I don't necessarily view investments in one, I don't, I don't view the, the fund balance as being in competition with, with other investments, and, and I never have. I've always thought the fund balance is just something that we need to do in order to restore the city's financial conditions so that we can accomplish uh, bigger goals down the road. Um, economic development is uh, critical for the city. Uh, increased density in our commercial districts. Uh, if you look around the region, uh, if you look at localities that have higher ratios of commercial assessed value relative to residential value, uh, they have higher spending per capita and lower tax rates per capita. That's the payoff, and that's what we're working so hard to accomplish. And so part of it is staff resources to make that happen. Part of it is an incentive policy, which the City Council has recently adopted, so we can try to accelerate some, some developments that uh, might not be right over the tipping point in terms of their economic feasibility, but if there's things that the city can do to push them over that tipping point to make them happen, uh, we have signaled to the market that we'll, we're willing to do that. We did it for the BJ's project. Uh, we have policy now to set the parameters and sort of the rules of the road for how we would do that when appropriate for other types of very attractive development that we want to bring to the city. pointed out that uh, part of the appropriations to the reserves are going to fund capital projects in the future. So it's, it's not that we're just putting money away in a piggy bank that we're never going to use and we're letting other things suffer. We are trying to address a multiple number of issues at once. Just on, on the economic development point, I think council, um, thanks. Uh, through its policies and discussions and its retreat made economic development and infrastructure building some of our core principles and things that we wanted to tackle in the years to come. So with what Wyatt's described, one of the policies that we set forward was really setting out a policy and making it very transparent of things like tax or increment financing, things that would help um, spur projects, but again in a very transparent way. And we took those actions, as Wyatt mentioned earlier in the year, uh, BJ's was done um, prior to the actual policy, but we are seeing um, some interest in discussing those policies to help spur economic development. And I think one, one thing that's worth noting in some of the positions that Wyatt right now has proposed is in the planning department, and the purpose of that is really to kind of build the foundations for economic development as we move forward. So I think those are some of the goals that we're trying to reach as well. Hi, Wyatt. Greg Rasnick. Um, I just had a couple questions. One, first, well, first a comment. I uh, thought you put a great budget together. I um, want to congratulate the, the mayor uh, and the city council on everything they're doing in terms of out-year budgeting. I think multi-year planning is a, a really great move for the city. Uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, in our first sort of three-way meeting the other night between Planning Commission, uh, City Council, and School Board. I wanted to ask you, um, to sort of give us an idea what the economic assumptions for growth and revenue going forward are based on. Um, I know that they've sort of been at this 2% model for a little while, um, and I, I know that it's something that you guys are looking at. I hope it's a, a target that you're willing to, to take a, you know, that you could update, because it's very important if we're gonna be trying to budget uh, in a multi-year fashion that those assumptions sort of meet with reality. And uh, I think, you know, Vice Mayor Snyder came in with some new data from one of the leading economists for the entire region, if not one of the national leading economists, Dr. Fuller, that showed that the economic growth model could be something upwards of twice that in this region over the next few years. So I'd like for you to sort of 
first explain what those assumptions are based on and if there's a possibility that those assumptions could be updated. Uh, so that's part one. Uh, part two is because in, you know council has made uh, infrastructure such an important piece of their policy guidance, I do see an uptick in terms of the city taking on debt service, but it's still well below the policy limit. And my question is, if we have so much citizen concern about infrastructure and we have historically low interest rates, you know, why isn't the city contemplating maybe, you know, I'm not saying we have to max out our credit card, but it does seem like this would be the best time to issue bonds, to borrow money, uh, to meet some of these infrastructure needs. Thanks. The um, multi-year forecasting, we, uh, we go to a lot of regional meetings, and I think one of the big issues that local governments are facing is what has built everything that we see around us, what's built our personnel system, what's built our, our, our employees uh, base, has been about a 5% annual growth in expenditures. That's, that's normal. And the question is, is 5% revenue growth going to be normal in the future? And I think the general view or the general concern is uh, perhaps not. And uh, that's because of where we've been, where we've, uh, we've had to, every, every local government and every government in the country has had to uh, do a lot of painful downsizing because that old normal trajectory, the bottom fell out of it very sharply after 2008. So what's, what is the future? Well, no one knows. I think for, for multi-year forecasting, what is useful is probably to have a range and say here's, here's uh, uh, what would happen if it grew at 0%, at, uh, at it was flat. Here's what would happen if it grew at 5% um, and, and um, make some uh, assessment as to what the world looks like under those scenarios. Uh, we have been using 2% growth and that is uh, uh, Stephen Fuller, I think, is forecasting regional uh, gross product growing at between 3 and 4% per annum um, in the out years. So uh, we're, we're multi-year forecasting on the low end, I'd say, on, on those projections. And I think that's partly informed by where we've been. We, we don't want to project r rosy scenarios. On the other hand, you don't want that, that uh, modeling practice to be so constraining that you can't accomplish what you need to accomplish. So that, I think that's some general commentary on, on multi-year budgeting. What is most useful, though, is to try to do that multi-year forecasting on the expenditure side, because there are things that you can identify. Here, here we're going to need to replace police cars. We're going to need to do HVAC repairs at schools. We're going to need to have a capital program. Those are things you plug into your multi-year forecast so that they're not surprises when they come down the pike and you have to wrestle with them. And I think that's been the most useful part of, of the exercise. Uh, there, there was one other question about, uh, about debt. Um, one part of it, we, we've got a $15.6 million program for FY13. That's a lot for us to manage. Uh, that, I think that's uh, part of our calculation in terms of our size. How much in projects can we manage in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effective way? Um, and we need to be mindful of that. The, uh, the CIP also um, has longer year horizons than just the five year. So we know we've got uh, some big expensive school projects that are outside that five year period. And so part of our, CIP, our capital planning thinking is we need to make sure we've, we're maintaining capacity so that if we have larger projects down the road, we've got room to maneuver. Lindy. <clears throat> Okay, along with Lindy Hockenberry, Planning Commission. Uh, just a couple of comments on the CIP. This is the first year the Planning Commission has actually gotten to do anything that really looks like it's going to actually do some growth within the city and within the next five years. But um, I'd like you to address, you know, I came in late, maybe you've done this, but address uh, the, the uh, structure of our bond rating, which I'm very proud of, still remains the uh, AAA bond rating. Fairfax is going to have trouble with that this year. And also, back to Richard, what we've been able to do with our bond rating as far as refinancing the bonds that we have out there and being able to save some money. 
and just the fact that, yeah, money is very, very cheap now. So if we do have projects, which I've spoken out quite often at the Planning Commission and with joint meetings with City Council, particularly in uh, the case of renovation of the City Hall, that if we can do things all together and get it done more cheaply, we need to move on that rather than doing things and undoing them to do something else along the way. Uh, because I'm a big thinker as far as really doing things competently in renovations. I've seen, seen things done too often over the, my years with the schools where you know, it was downgraded and it had to be redone and everything. And so I'm very, very sensitive to that. So triple bond rating and what we've been able to do uh, as far as refinancing. And we've been able to do some really good stuff, I know, to save us a lot of money. You want to talk bond rating? Because that goes in the fund balance. Well, in terms of uh, barn rating, um, we have had um, two conference calls with barn rating agencies where they've reviewed our financial statements, our financial policies, and it has resulted in, uh, in excess of $2 million in savings. We've done two refinancings in the last six months. Um, in terms of um, the capital planning, and let me, let me go back to that, and Wyatt touched on it. Um, it's fine to say let's take advantage of low rates and borrow a lot of money, but you can't borrow it and not use it. It has to be spent within certain time limits, otherwise there are penalties. So we try to plan the capital projects, number one, in terms of how much we need to borrow, how much we can actually accomplish from those borrowings, okay, and then we move forward. Um, we will try to accelerate. Um, projects as fast and as uh, feasible as we can. Uh, we also will look at refinancing options whenever they present themselves. Well, well, again, when we have those conference calls, those are some of the things that the rating agencies look at. They, they look at um, what our financial goals are, what our policies are, how we meet our targets. So if we set a 17% target for our fund balance reserves, they want to know that we've met it. They want to know that if you fall short of it, what is your recovery plan? Um, they also like to see that you set aside reserves for other things for uh, your capital because they want to know that they can get their money back once they lend it. The, um, when, we, uh, when we were doing this, uh, we traveled to New York to meet with the bond rating agencies to talk with them about this, and we laid out for them a plan to get back to this, and really with strong leadership from the city council, this is not easy to do. This is very difficult to do at a time when you're cutting your budget to put more money back towards your reserves. Uh, the rating agencies, when, when we were drawing them down, they said, okay, well, we're not going to downgrade you right now, but if you don't do what you say you're going to do, we will. And, um, and the council did what it said it was going to do, and so we've been able to maintain high ratings, and we've been able to save the taxpayers a lot of money because of that. Um, I agree with Wyatt that that's not easy to do, and all we have to do is ask the local employees and the school board and everybody else who's tried to manage with less. Um, but I think it's a bit overselling the point when we say that a downgrade is going to be so um, difficult or so burdensome. The, let's recall the United States government was downgraded and what we saw in the wake of that was interest rates actually falling. So I'm not saying that we should go out and try to degra degrade or you know diminish our ratings but let's not oversell what a AAA rating means and also bear in mind that there's no um, 4A rating or 5A rating. So we don't want to oversell um, our sort of fiscal um, situation. Thanks. It's uh, Phil. At the Tuesday League uh, Forum on Privatization, uh, one of the topics was the water system. And one of the options that you mentioned was that we would go to uh, language uh, on a referendum sometime in July. I'm just wondering if this budget 
includes any uh, extra money for whatever consulting work is required to to go to bond uh, to go to referendum if we do that and uh, if there's any uh, communications expenses that would be involved in trying to get information out to the public over the course of the summer and fall if we did go to a vote in November on that. Um, we, uh, we have budgeted funds both for legal and for uh, uh, consulting services to help us with, with uh, evaluation of these options. Uh, so, so the answer to that question is yes. Kind of curious about the two planning positions. Uh, given a government as small as ours, it just looks kind of unusual to add two of the exact same positions in the same department at the same time versus maybe adding one, seeing what the results are, and if they're gangbusters, maybe adding another one later. And I haven't seen the case that was pitched. I just thought maybe you would highlight that. Well, I think uh, part of the thinking on the positions in the planning department is we have, as a city, in the past, whenever we've wanted to try to accomplish a, a big project in the planning area, we've gone out to the consulting market and you know, paid money for someone to come from the outside to help us do the city center plan or um, updates to our comp comprehensive plan. Um, our thinking on this is that rather than take that route, um, instead we'll try to do this work internally. And our thinking is, is that will produce a more effective result. Uh, very often when we've had outside consultants, they've produced great work, but they produce something and then they leave and, um, and does, is there real buy-in to actually accomplish that plan or is that plan really, is, is it feasible? And um, so what we're trying to do here is build the internal capacity to both to do the planning but also to carry it out, implement it with the right zoning, working with developers to make it happen. So. Uh, it's, it's partly a difference of approach and philosophy that we're trying to take with it as well. Why did it make sense to give schools an opportunity to um, make their presentation and then come back to all, all the questions again, just so we're seeing a holistic picture of the budget, not, not just the partial? So that would be my suggestion, Susan and, and Dr. Jones, if, if you'd like to take the mic and then we'll come back to <coughs> questions again after you're done. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out on Saturday morning to visit with us. I'm Susan Carney. I'm the chair of the school board. Uh, before I start, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Tony Jones, the superintendent, for presenting us with a fantastic foundation in her recommendations for the school board this year. It's her first year, and I think she just did a terrific job of understanding how our schools operate and as well how our city operates. And we all know that we do have the Falls Church way here. So I think that, is, uh, that was terrific. Okay, what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to step you through a few things. First, it's kind of the bottom line, what are the numbers, kind of the facts part. Um, then we're going to look at some trends and comparisons so you can see how this recommendation fits in with other recommendations. And then I'm going to take you through and just talk to you about some of the highlights, some of the things that are in the budget, and give you some numbers about those things. All right, first, um, our city has had excellent schools for a number of years, primarily due to three things, small schools, small classes, outstanding staff. We all know that's been the base formula. Over the last few years, the school board has started to focus on a couple of other things as well in terms of our strategy and the five pillars of excellence for our schools because we think that uh, going forward, those things are an important addition. The first one is we've been focusing on uh, 20th century learning and teaching. Uh, our schools, um, I guess a nice way to, to say it would be, we're not as technologically advanced as we should be. We uh, have a dearth in that area, and we think that going forward to serve our students, we need to catch up. So we're going to be focusing on that. And then the fifth pillar is really going the extra mile to take care of our neediest students. So the budget that I'm going to present to you today looks at all five of those pillars as a framework. First, the bottom line, you'll see here. The total budget request from the schools is almost $38 million, a little bit shy of that, with about a $30 million transfer from the city. Uh, we have three budgets, the, the operating budget, which is the real money that runs the schools every day. It pays for buses and teachers and books and materials and those kinds of things. The community services budget, uh, the daycare fund sits in there, the cable TV station sits in there, and all of the expenses and revenues from use of the schools by the community 
sits in there. And then food service, which is essentially um, a self-operating fund combined uh, with what parents pay for lunches and meals and what the federal government uh, gives us for those things. And so you'll see that um, the community services transfer is flat and about a $2 million increase in the operating request from the city for the schools. Um, here's a little bit of a longitudinal look at the uh, history of the city transfer to the schools. You can see that uh, last year we were just a little shy of 43% of the city's operating budget this year will be just about the same. You can see when the recession kicked in pretty dramatically here. Um, but as uh, if we look historically, we see that the money going to the schools is much lower than it has traditionally and historically been here in the city. And I would expect uh, as the city's health improves that you would see that percentage to the schools beginning to increase again. So now let's switch and let's talk about just the operating budget because that's the part that most people have the most interest in. Uh, I mentioned the city transfer. This is about a 7.3% increase. Our state funding has gone up just a touch. We've lost a boatload of federal funding. This was the funding that we got from the federal government to help us get through the recession, the ARA funding. Uh, we're having a lot less problem with that than many divisions because we use those monies for one-time expenses rather than ongoing staff or teachers. But nonetheless, it's a lot of money to lose. And then you can see uh, the other components here. Uh, the sources of revenue, our biggest source of revenue obviously for the um, city schools is the city transfer. Um, many school divisions in this state don't have that. Uh, but the key sources here are the city transfer. You notice this is our fiscal year 13 request. I'm pleased to say that we're now at just about the level we were in terms of a city transfer that we were in fiscal year 09. So you can see we had the dip here and now coming back. The same with um, the state money. So um, what's been going on since fiscal year nine? <laughs> As you've seen those dips in uh, the transfer and the dips in the money that we're getting. Well, what's been going on is we've been having more and more students come to our city. In fact, since fiscal year 09, we've uh, increased almost 15% in terms of the number of kids in our schools. And uh, it's almost 300 students. This last year, we had a huge increase, almost 5%. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you do the math, what does that mean? Same amount of money, a lot more kids. It means our ability to spend per student, which is the measure in education of your investment resource, has gone down dramatically. From fiscal year 09, 18 plus thousand to 16,500. The thing that's interesting to understand about this is um, What's been squeezed out as this number has dropped, because we still must pay teachers <laughs> and we must have buses, is uh, programs, materials, textbooks, uh, and those kinds of things for the kids. So we're doing an awful lot with a lot less in the schools than we were back in 2009, and it's time to start turning that around. So the five pillars of excellence. What I wanted to do was just cement those ideas in your head. That's the framework we use for thinking about the schools and talk about some of the top line things that are in the budget that fit those pillars. First, small schools. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about our CIP request from the city, um, but what we've signaled in our CIP request from the school board is our devotion to small schools. What this means is we've asked for money in the CIP to either significantly renovate or rebuild the Cherry Street property for a pre-K program for our children. We've asked for money at Mount Daniel to bring it up to ADA and other codes as well as add classrooms for a K-1 school. We've asked for money for Thomas Jefferson for, to complete phase two of that project. That school will be a grade two, three, four, five school. There had been a lot of chatter in the city about that becoming a mega elementary school and having first through sixth there or kindergarten through sixth there, a thousand students. The school board has said, no, that's not the direction. That doesn't fit the Falls Church way. 
we believe in small schools. So our CIP this year is very much a reflection of the value that we have. Uh, the one thing that isn't in the CIP this year that we're going to have to take up, <laughs> and soon, and I don't know how to do it, is George Mason. We do have a high school that is old, it leaks like a sieve, it's tough to secure, it's inefficiently built, and, <laughs> and otherwise just out of date. Um, that's going to be a lot of money. That's a $100 million project for our little city. Um, so we, uh, we did request $80 million across two years in our CIP request to the city. That's not included in the CIP this year. But that is a discussion that we need as a community to begin having in a serious way. All right, small classes in this budget. We hire seven additional teachers. 15% more kids means you need more teachers or class sizes get too big for what we uh, think is appropriate here in Falls Church. Those are primarily at the elementary and middle school levels to reduce class sizes. There are two teaching staff included to um, be added at George Mason for special ed because the caseloads there are too high to get the results that we need for our kids. Uh, 21st century teaching and learning. This is really exciting. We're investing in um, hybrid learning. This is a new thing for Falls Church, which is where we take uh, online content for courses and combine it in a lab environment with our fabulous Falls Church teachers to provide flexibility for our students who need to learn a different way, who need remediation, so on and so forth. So we're bringing uh, technology-based learning into our schools, finally. Uh, we're also supporting dual enrollment and real-time assessment kinds of tools so we can see very quickly where students are in their progress and make strategies to help them improve very, very rapidly. Uh, outstanding staff. This uh, incorporates a full step increase for our staff. On average, that's about 3%. Um, most staff will not really see 3% because of uh, changes in the VRS laws, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, we also have um, stepped up pay for a certain very specific sector of teachers. These are teachers that have experience and a master's degree. If you look at our um, salary scales, you'll see that those teachers are underpaid relative to surrounding jurisdictions by as much as 15%. $10,000, $11,000, $12,000 a year, that's a lot of difference. And these are the teachers that, um, as we would say, we heart in Falls Church. Our master's level teachers who have experience under their belt are some of our most productive. So we feel like we have to fix this. Otherwise, we'll hire brilliant teachers with bachelor's degrees. We'll train them. They'll um, achieve their masters, and then they will leave us. And we don't want that. And then finally, uh, we've requested that the city set aside some funds, depending on how the budget for the state really turns out, which we do not know yet, to uh, a rainy day fund of sorts for VRS, in case in the future we need more money. And then finally, in terms of readiness to learn, uh, several years ago, under the leadership of uh, Joan Wadiska, who's also on the school board, we started down a path to make sure that we had no children in our schools who were hungry, because hungry kids can't learn. And we want to make sure that every child in our school has an opportunity to learn. So what we started a few years ago was for kids who qualify for reduced lunch, uh, the school board wants them to have that lunch for free. <coughs> and so we've been doing that. I think this is the, th Kieran, is it the third or fourth year? Third. This is the third year that we're doing that for our students. Um, then last year we expanded that. We now offer a breakfast program to kids in all of our schools for kids who um, qualify for free or reduced lunch. If you qualify for free, you get it for free. If you qualify for reduced, then the school board once again picks up the cost of that breakfast for that child. If you don't qualify, then you buy lunch just like, I mean breakfast just like you would lunch. Um, this year what we've included to expand this is um, what we call a backpacks program. And what this means is on weekends and in the summer, we're going to continue to provide food for kids who are hungry, who need to be fed. We're really proud of this. This is unique in the state, if not the nation, for a school board and for a community to take on this uh, item in such a direct way to make a difference for, for kids. And then one of our staffers, Mary Beth Connolly, you probably know Mary Beth, she came to me one day and said, well, if we give them a, pa a backpack, why don't we put a book in there too? because these kids don't have books at home to read for the most part as well. So we're going to do a community drive, keep your ears open. We're going to be asking for people to donate new and generally use books for these kids as well. So what are the highlights? Um, here um, we put some numbers to the things that I've just talked to you about. 
First, uh, the step increase is about $720,000 for our staff. Um, I want to call your attention to VS, uh, uh, VRS retirement. There's not a budget in the state, as you know, yet. But the governor's request in the budget increased our um, contribution to VRS retirement by a little over a million dollars. This is a bunch more than we thought, a big bunch more than we had thought. But we are required to do this. <laughs> so that is in our budget. But what you'll see here is um, the uh, General Assembly also has uh, decided to require our teachers and other staff to start contributing to their own retirement. Um, for uh, certain of our staff, they already do. People in the city's retirement fund already contribute. Our newer employees that are in the new VRS already contribute. Um, this money is for um, our employees that don't, employees who've been in the VR system for a long time. Well, now they're going to have to start up to contribute up to 5%. We are rolling it in at 1% a year. And um, what we're required to do by law is to give them a pay increase to counterbalance that. Since we're already giving our employees an increase in our budget, what we simply are doing is rolling that into the increase. So our staff really, for the most part, are getting an effective 2% increase, not really a 3% increase. Hopefully that's not too much inside baseball. Um, we've had increases in uh, VRS life that's connected to this retirement. This is the mid-range salary adjustment, the new teachers, and so on. I do want to highlight and be completely transparent about the fact that there's an increase in salary for school board members in our budget recommendation this year. Currently, a member of the school board gets paid $100 a month. The chairman gets paid $150 a month. And we're increasing that to $350 a month for a member, $400 for the vice chair, and $500 for the chairman. This, uh, this is, um, for us, an important thing to try to ensure, A, <laughs> that we have more candidates for school board. If you'll notice in this school board election, we have exactly as many candidates as there are seats. In last election two years ago, there were exactly as many candidates as there were seats. And in both elections, I've had a number of people talk to me about school board who have children or who don't have high levels of income who feel like they can't afford to be on school board because of the uh, out-of-pocket expense that, that we've been paying as school board members uh, over the last few years. So we're increasing this primarily to see if we can get more people uh, to run for school board, more people who are representative of the diverse nature of our, our community. Um, the superintendent has done a f fabulous job this year of reprogramming and reorganizing. Uh, half a million dollars. What this means is she looked inside her organization and found places to make to save. This includes a streamlining of central office staff and some other reprogramming as well. So I want to congratulate her on that. That's just outstanding to find a half million dollars at this point to do that. Uh, we've lost some money for cost of competing and then of course this is the federal stimulus fund money that I mentioned at the top. Half a million dollars. Uh, the last thing I want to share with you is that as a part of our adoption of budget recommendations, the school board sent three messages to our colleagues on city council. The first one is uh, the budget recommendation that we're making does not fund all school needs. However, it is what we believe is responsible given the revenue forecast we were provided by the city. Uh, so we're asking that if it turns out by the end of the year, that the revenue forecast was low and there are extra funds, that some of those funds be shared back to the schools to meet our needs. Uh, the second goes back to the VRS issue. Uh, if it turns out in the state budget, when it is passed, that we don't have to give all that money to VRS that we have in our budget, uh, rather than spend it on something else, we'd like it set aside in a rainy day fund for future needs for VRS. We don't know if there will be any but we'd like to see it happen that way. Um, and then finally, um, the school board has been working with city council for a year and a half, I, I guess now, on a revenue share agreement. What a revenue share agreement says is that uh, there's a predictable way that dollars in the general fund are split between city operations and school operations each year. There are revenue share agreements in Arlington, in Prince William, in the city of Manassas, and lots of places. This is a proven method for giving schools a predictable future flow of revenue that they can plan to. 
and we'd like to see that happen in this city as well. So we're asking them once again to work with us on such a revenue share agreement that we hope would be in place for this time next year. That's the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Can you provide a little bit more detail on the revenue sharing aspect? If, uh, since predictions are so difficult to make, if a prediction is provided for school board for a five-year vision, of what the revenues or what the general fund looks like. How can you plan to it? I can only liken it to a household budget. Uh, if I try, try to plan for something in two years, the condition may actually be different. Right. How, how does that help you? I just yeah. don't understand. OK, thanks for that question, I'm happy to say. So the revenue share ha generally happens in the current budget year. right? So for example, the city of Manassas has an agreement. I can't remember what the number is, but that simply says, the schools receive X percent, 50 percent of revenue that comes into the city of Manassas every year. Now, if revenue goes up, the schools get more money. If revenue goes down, the schools get less money. But it's a partnership between the general government and the schools that says you can bank on having this percent of the money. The reason it's good for schools, you can't protect the dollar, it's the share, yeah. Yeah, and exactly. I, and I think we've had some very positive dialogue yes, in the have. liaison meeting about it. Um, what's caused a little bit of the issues about not putting it together or where there's been um, issues that we still need to work through, as Tina mentioned, there are sort of unpredictables like VRS, um, operating costs, school enrollment, um, upticks that we may see, some that can be planned for, others that can't be planned mm -hmm. for. So it's been an issue of how do we address those types of issues and that's sort of the phase that we're in is continuing that dialogue about how we would meet those kind of unexpected and in this year's budget I think we've had very good dialogue with the school board in trying to at least think about a revenue share model light if you will um, for this year's budget that's probably the best way to describe it the goal was sort of how would that look like how would it begin to unfold without actually formally adopting um, something and then mm -hmm. moving forward, how do we address some of the more uh, tougher questions moving forward? Mm -hmm. I think the thing about a revenue share, I mean, there are a couple of things about it. I mean, I think in part this is the school board's reaction to the fact that we, our budget process comes before the cities. And when we are doing our budget process, there are many unknowns. <laughs> and we try to write a responsible budget recommendation. We try to ask what we think we need with an eye towards city finances not something that's a negotiating position, not something that's extra money. We ask for what we need. And in the last few years, as it's turned out at the end of the day, um, what we feel is our share of resources in the city has been dwindling and dwindling and dwindling, as you can see from that chart. Now, maybe that that's the right thing to do because of the financial condition of the city in the last few years, but we would prefer to understand that we have a set amount of that revenue for our planning purposes. The second thing is it really does signal, um, I think, a very collegial and integrated partnership between the schools and the city when you have a revenue share agreement in place. We're working together very closely, not that we aren't now, but it does kind of signal that. So, Yes? If the city reduces, if the city reduces its budget during the determination of its overall budget, its share, in order to fund the school's request, how do you determine in advance, if there's new revenue, whether uh, a higher share ought to go to the city to fund the things it didn't fund in order to fund the schools? I'm not sure I understand how you agree in advance to an equitable split. I mean, I think on everything you've said foundationally makes a certain amount of sense that there's at least an examination of whether you should get some, but I don't, I don't see how it works to agree in advance to a fixed percentage. Um, uh, I, I guess all I'll say is that this is a, a known method. Many cities and school divisions use it, and they are very um, happy with it. 
Um, I actually have a lot of people who come to me and say, why would you want that? You can just ask for more, 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 more. <laughs> and in the City Falls Church, you can probably get it because people are all about the schools. That's not the position of the school board. However, the school board would like to understand that, for example, uh, we are going to have a 46% or 47% share of the revenue. We can forecast, we can plan over multiple years, as opposed to what you saw here, which is it's 45, 46, 47, now down 42, 43. That's a big difference for us. It's a big difference. The details we haven't worked out, as, as uh, Nader said, we're, we're looking through that. They're all different methods, different people use. Manassas is quite simple. It's X percent of the revenue period. In Arlington, it's X percent of the revenue plus a certain amount per student to take into consideration when you have growth in uh, the population of students. So there are a lot of details uh, to be worked out. Our concern, um, you know, quite plainly is that um, there were a couple of years where we had a budget and as it turned out, we were short revenue in the city. And uh, when we were short revenue in the city, the schools were asked to kind of reduce our budget, and we did, we, and gladly, and return money back to the city. But um, it doesn't necessarily happen the opposite way when there's more revenue at the end of the day. The schools don't necessarily get a share of that. And it's important because our budget does not always reflect all of our needs. For example, we're still behind in compensation. We're way behind in technology. We significantly cut materials, you know, so we have things that aren't in our budget. And uh, so that would help balance the needs between the city and schools. Mr. Kimball? Uh, Dave, hi. Hunter Kimball. Uh, I, think, I think to your point, the way uh, my concept of the revenue sharing agreement would work and in looking at other divisions, um, in terms of, of, of the revenue to which you allude and that, you know, if there's a shortfall, um, historically, what has happened I in the city is that, that, in fact, the general government side has absorbed a greater portion of that shortfall than, than the school board has. Under a revenue sharing agreement, you, you, you pick a point in time and say, you know, 45, 55, for example. The revenue that year f comes in below projected the schools, in fact, would have to ab absorb that decrease in revenue on that same percentage. Um, and therefore, if, you know, the bounty would be shared equally and also the, um, any underfunding, the, the impact of that would be shared equally as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just a couple comments, not necessarily for the choir here, but uh, for the TV audience. Uh, so we went through a recession uh, a couple years ago and the school system had to come up with better communication tools. And I think they came up with just one magnificent uh, product, the morning announcements. Mm -hmm. So for the, uh, the public out there that uh, wants to know more about what's going on in the schools, uh, they need to subscribe to this daily email that uh, you get that ba basically takes you through a day of, uh, of the life in the, of the school children in our school system. Yeah. It has increased my knowledge of what's going on in our system tenfold at least. So just to, to acknowledge that, and I give credit basically to, I think, Lois Berlin, who came up with a lot of innovative ideas, I think, that helped during the recession time when your budget was a lot less. So uh, sets the tone for Tony to keep it going, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, second smaller item, uh, you know, in the Lions Club, we out there uh, selling fruit in the cold winter days to support our community. And uh, we would love to help you with uh, some of the uh, 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 programs that you want to start for the less privileged uh, school children. So keep us in mind, and mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're glad to help. All right. Thanks, Barry, for that. Tony, take that note. <laughs> we'll get back to you for sure. Thanks. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks for coming again. I know Saturday's a day that we all want to sleep or read the paper or take a jog or spend it with our kids, and I really appreciate you coming out. Check our website, and you'll find budget documents that are more detailed for you. Um, read my commentary in the news press this week. It'll give you a more ordered presentation of what I just told you, and we'll look forward to maybe seeing you next time. And um, again, thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. What I thought we would do is also uh, give a couple ways where the public can provide input. I think Wyatt has the email address uh, where we're going to be taking um, public comments, uh, similar to what we did last year, and some upcoming dates again. So Wyatt, if you can repeat the web address and also the dates. Yes. Uh, if you just go on the city's web page, we have budget information very prominently featured in this presentation. And um, all of our presentations are posted on the web page. 
um, comments, send them to budget at fallschurchva.gov. And so any email, if you're, any email address is always fallschurchva.gov. Just put budget in the name and it will get to us and we will answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for being here on a Saturday morning and, and have a great weekend. Thank you.